So thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, this is the International Primatology Lecture Series, Past, Present, and Future Perspectives of the Field. And I am Andrew McIntosh, Associate Professor at Kyoto University's Wildlife Research Center, um, based in Inuyama at the uh, Center for the Evolutionary Origins of Human Behavior. And this seminar series or lecture series is brought to you by the Center for International Collaboration and in Advanced Studies in Primatology, which is based at eHub and very much interested in kind of spreading the world in primatology and wildlife science. And in this lecture series, we like to offer origin stories from established primatologists, wildlife scientists, conservationists, behaviorists, you name it, uh, to share that with you all. And this is the 16th lecture in our series. And I'm really excited to be having here Dr. James Anderson uh, to share his own personal uh, primatological promenade with us. So as usual, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Michael Huffman, my good colleague here uh, for a more in-depth introduction. Thanks, Andrew. Um, welcome everyone. Um, as Andrew just said, this is the 16th um, lecture, Time Flies. We've had a lot of interesting talks over the last several months. Um, and today is going to be another one of those, I'm sure. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to to have Jim talk with us here. He's 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 been on the, the primatological landscape as far as I've been watching when I started back in 1979. He was already doing his work. And I remember after my first um, publication, I think it was in 1984, after I became a graduate student, I got this postcard in the mail from this distinguished sounding um, gentleman from Europe asking for a copy of my paper. And I I, I figured I had made the big times when, when someone actually wanted to read what I had to write. Um, and that that continued for many years. Jim was always writing, um, reaching out to people for, for their publications. And we were just talking before we started here. And he said he's he, among his many collectibles, he's he acquired over 30,000 reprints from scientists around the world in all the diverse areas of his interest. Um, that's that's pretty impressive. If if he could get one dollar for each of those, um, that would have been something. But he's generously donated those to, um, I guess it's there. It's it's set up in Oxford at at Susanna Carvola's um, lab. So that's a very, very nice, nice thing to have done. Um, Jim has led a very, very interesting life. He's he's lived in many places. And the last place that he's ended up, the most recent place that he's ended up is here in Japan. And he joined us at Kyoto University. So we had a very, um, very nice several years in, interacting at, at meetings and things, getting to know him a little bit better. And he's he's still here. He's an old old Japanese hand now. So um, he's, he's got some stories to tell about that work here as well, no doubt. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce my good friend, Jim, and he'll tell us about his primatological promenade. Take it away, Jim. Okay, so thank you for that introduction, Mike. Um, and I'd also like to thank Andrew for the organization and Susumu and Cassia as well for helping to make this happen. Um, I'm in the wrong place here, so uh, let me get back to the start. Um, so I uh, would like to thank everyone for the invitation, the kind invitation to, to give this talk. I've never done this kind of overview of my career um, until now. So it's been very interesting deciding what I could consider to be highlights um, and realizing what were some of the lowlights. Um, so I've put together really some of the papers that I think are maybe worth sharing with, with people. Um, and most of these papers are not possible, would not have been possible without the help of many people um, and some of the most important people that have contributed in one way or another to my career are listed here. 
some of you might recognize many of them, probably one or two of them won't be so familiar, um, but we don't have to worry about that. So let's start. Um, and my interest in primates really emerged when I was studying psychology at the University of Stirling uh, in Scotland. I went to Stirling in 1973. Um, why Stirling? Well, it was near to Glasgow where I grew up. Um, nice little city, um, not far, with its ancient castle and a new university. It was only six years old at the time. Uh, and I went there originally to study English literature. Soon realized that was a big mistake, um, especially when I, I, I found out that I was going to have to read the entire works of Chaucer uh, in the, my third semester. Um, so I made a plea to the professors at, in the psychology department whether I could continue in psychology, having missed one of the semesters. And uh, for some reason, they allowed me to continue. And uh, I'm always grateful to those two professors for that decision. Um, now, one of the interesting features of the psychology department in Stirling was that it had its own primate unit with these animals, stump-tailed macaques. And Here's a, a, an old picture of the Stirling campus from back then. And down at the bottom right are student residences. There's a, a bridge going across to the library, teaching uh, classrooms and lecture theatres. And in this block here, you might be able to see there are no windows. That's because uh, on this side, uh, it was the, the, the primate unit, which housed at one point up to 80 of these stump-tailed macaques. Very successful breeding colony. Um, and uh, here's a more recent aerial picture of the, the, the university. And what was the primate unit? Uh, that block now has windows because the primate unit no longer exists uh, and it's been converted to offices. Um, but you can see that the roof is slightly different. That's because back then part of the roof was open, well, covered with a uh, metal grill, um, but it, it, to allow the monkeys to have access to sunlight. So in my third and fourth years, uh, I was able to do some little projects on the stump tail macaques there, thanks to the director of the primate unit then, Arnold Shemov. And for my final honours undergraduate project, I decided to do a little study based on this kind of behaviour, um, ventral ventral contact or huddling. And we knew back then this was not long after some of the uh, later studies by Harlow on the importance of contact comfort uh, in the formation of emotional attachments between mothers and infants. Um, Harlow's work showed that um, contact comfort was more important than milk. And here you can see one of his famous or infamous pictures of a monkey spending its time not on this wire mesh mother that can offer it milk, but although it might go there in order to feed, it will then quickly come back and uh, embrace the, the soft um, towel covered mother. And uh, not only infants do this, but also in some species of macaque monkeys, when monkeys are uh, resting or sleeping, they will also huddle together. Sometimes it's ventral dorsal, so a monkey might be uh, huddling against the back of another one, it may be lateral, or sometimes it's actually ventral ventral. So I wondered whether if the monkeys were separated from their group 
for a relatively short time, 24 hours, would they increase their huddling with their favourite huddling partner before the separation? Um, and so we, we, we did that on the, a number of the adults in the, the group. And uh, they were highly used to being separated from each other for feeding and just to ensure that everyone got adequate feeding, uh, adequate amounts of food. So we just prolonged some of those separations for one day, then removed the partition and the individual went back into the group. Um, and what we found actually, we, we also focused on grooming because of course, stump-tail macaques uh, don't only huddle with each other, they also have um, fairly strong grooming relationships. And what we found was that grooming went up um, considerably after these separations, but huddling actually went down, except for ventral ventral huddling, which was maintained with the favourite huddling partner. Um, so there was increased grooming, but no increased huddling. So that was quite interesting, I thought. Um, and Arnold suggested, let's send this to a journal, which he had published in previously called the Journal of Behavioral Science. So we wrote up the, my dissertation and sent it and heard nothing for nine months. And so eventually, this was before email, and online submissions, everything was done via snail mail. And sometimes you would send a manuscript under separate cover. Uh, you'd send the cover letter by email, air mail, and inform the editor that the manuscript was going to arrive later and so on. Um, and eventually we got uh, information from the editor saying that, uh, yes, you're, manuscript was accepted and it's been published. And we changed our name from Journal of Behavioral Science to the South African Journal of Psychology. So I guess you could say in some ways that was lucky, not even nasty reviewer comments to deal with and they accepted the paper. Um, that paper, didn't really get cited very often, possibly partly because the South African Journal of Psychology was probably being boycotted by some scientists because that was still the time of apartheid. Um, and I noticed that I, I was happy to discover the first citation that I'm aware of was actually by Jane Goodall in her 1986 book uh, on the, the Gombe chimpanzees. And it's been cited uh, a few times since then. Um, and so based on that and my general undergraduate work, uh, I was offered the possibility to stay on and do a, a PhD at Stirling. And uh, I'll explain a little bit more about how it came about. And while I was doing my PhD work, I noticed that some of the monkeys living in the, the social group, the, the group consisted of animals that originally came from Thailand, if my memory's right. So wild caught animals and their offspring. And some of the offspring had been separated for experimental studies different rearing conditions and so on. And they had been reintegrated into the group. But it was clear that some of them, although their social behavior seemed quite normal, they were prone to some unusual behaviors. And one of these was this self-directed aggression where the monkeys would sometimes threaten their own hands and feet and even bite themselves. And they would really get into a fight with themselves. And so I thought, well, this should be studied to, to look at some questions. Um, 
for example, when do they do it? How frequently do they show self-aggression compared to social aggression and so on? So uh, with Arnold, we did a series of studies looking at this um, and they got published. Um, and that was my first attempt at writing literature reviews. I gathered together just about everything I could find. And back then the literature was quite old. So there wasn't so much. And uh, I wrote a couple of reviews, one about just the, the general phenomenon of self-aggressive behavior, which has been recorded in um, normally reared monkeys under extreme stress as well. And one of the things I, I concluded from what I learned about it is that it wasn't the same as self-injurious behavior in humans. And some research teams, particularly in the US, were actually using this abnormal behavior in macaques as a model of human self-injurious behavior. And uh, I, I think, and I still believe, it's not an accurate model for several reasons. Um, but we don't need to go into that. Um, but we also looked at ways of reducing that uh, abnormal behavior. And one of the ways we, we found was to keep the monkeys occupied by simulating foraging behavior. And uh, we introduced different kinds of deep litters into the monkey's enclosures. And we found that if you even just scattered a handful of raisins or corn or monkey chow into the wood chips or wood wool, um, the monkeys would spend lots of time feeding, much more time keeping active than if the floor was bare, where they wouldn't spend so much time on the floor at all. Um, the monkeys were also much more tolerant of each other when they were feeding in deep litter compared to on a bare floor. Um, the, the dominant individuals would tend to try to monopolize the food that they could see on the bare floor. But if they had to search through the wood chips, then they would tolerate the presence of uh, more subordinate individuals. Uh, and as long as these monkeys were foraging, they had less time available to start getting into self-aggressive episodes or even social aggressive episodes. And so that was another thing that I did during the time I was doing my PhD research. But one of the deals for getting the, the studentship to continue at Stirling was an offer from Bill McGrew to spend a six month period in his newly established field site in Senegal. And um, so I was fortunate enough to, to join the team there for six months in 1977, just before I was going to start on my PhD research uh, on the captive monkeys. So I went out and uh, made uh, joined the, the, the observations on chimpanzees. This isn't a chimp that I saw, that's taken from a, a study by a team at Purdue University using camera traps um, more recently than, than uh, the, the Sterling project. Also, uh, some observations on baboons, noting the occurrence of patus monkeys. This is the best picture I ever took of a patus monkey. They're extremely elusive. And uh, Mike Harrison was also doing his PhD on the, the green monkeys around camp. Um, Neil Kolokoba Park, extremely seasonal, hot uh, in the, the dry season, wet and green in the, the, the rainy season. This is the camp conditions. Each of us lived in one of these huts and we often got soaked. Um, I went back to Senegal for a couple of months in 1979 
And Bill suggested that I took over from a project that he had started. And that involved looking at the baboons in one of their sleeping trees that they used sometimes, not every night. And in fact, here's a group of baboons walking past my hut, uh, having come down from their sleeping tree. And uh, so what it involved was getting up very early before daybreak in the morning, sitting at the edge of this cliff and looking up into the tree and noting as soon as you could make out the baboons, often it was their tails hanging down that gave the first indication. Um, and noting group size, the number of adult males, the huddle sizes, and so on. And this went on during wet season into the dry season. And we got quite a lot of interesting background information. And uh, the study is still cited um, these days. Um, we feel it deserves more attention than it, than it got, but uh, it was certainly an interesting study to do. Um, I'm not sure I would be so confident now about sitting with my back to the plateau where there might be a hungry lion or leopard around that hadn't found anything to eat that night. Um, but back then, uh, we didn't give it really a second thought. Um, while preparing the write-up for that paper, I collected hundreds of accounts of sleep-related behaviour in primates. And that led to me writing another review paper. And this is probably, may well be my most cited paper of everything that I've done. And I sent it, again, this is another stroke of luck. I sent it for some reason, I don't remember what, to Advances in the Study of Behaviour. And it got accepted with minimal changes. Um, and I also got a nice check from the publisher for writing it. So one piece of advice I would give to students, uh, especially when you're preparing your PhD, you will probably be really up to date and have knowledge of the literature. So consider writing reviews. They get well cited and it's your chance to show how, uh, how uh, much your, uh, to show off your knowledge about the, the current state of the literature. Um, now, I'm not a field worker. Uh, I, I, see, I, I only had two more brief forays into the field, one with uh, Liz Williamson, and we spent a three month period in Sapo National Park doing basically the first population survey of the chimpanzees um, in the park. And uh, it was quite a different environment. Um, from Neokolokoba in Senegal. And in fact, we didn't see much sunlight uh, in our time in the forest, as you can see from the colour uh, of me here. This is me with a suntan, believe it or not. Um, and we didn't see much of the chimpanzees either, but we did see lots of their, uh, lots of their signs, nests. We used nest counts to come up with population density estimates. And there was lots of uh, washing and sieving through chimpanzee droppings. So we discovered uh, on the basis of the contents of their feces that they were also eating monkeys. Um, and we also found plenty of evidence of nut cracking uh, using stone tools and stone and root anvils. So that extended the nut cracking population of Western chimpanzees to the Sapo forest chimpanzees. And then many years later, I found myself in southern India um, 
working as a consultant on an action movie, but that's a, a, another story. Um, and some of, some of the heroes of that movie were members of a group of bonnet macaques that inhabited the mountainside and the mountaintop. And it was my job uh, every morning to climb up the mountain, find the monkeys, alert the movie team whether the, it was worth their while coming up that day. Um, so I got to know the individuals in the group quite well. And uh, one day they were gone and they disappeared for two weeks. And we found them a few miles away on another hill uh, where there was a lake. And it so happened that the, the water sources on top of this hill had dried up. And while these monkeys were absent, a neighbouring group that almost never came here came up and took over the top of the, the mountain. So they had almost no water, but they got fed by humans. The humans normally fed the resident group. But for two weeks, this group, which really looked in poor condition, they didn't have as much resources as the, the resident group, but they enjoyed two weeks and I called it squatting uh, in the absence of the, the resident group. Two weeks later, this group came back and the other group withdrew peacefully. Um, and so I thought it was an interesting observation and I wrote it up as a, a small article. Um, but that was in the late nineties. Uh, I should say that I'm jumping back and forward in time here and from location to location. Um, a little bit like Kurt Vonnegut's uh, character in Slaughterhouse-Five, but uh, the, hopefully there's a general theme going through it. So anyway, back in Stirling, um, I did eventually complete my PhD thesis uh, after I think I took four years in all with the breaks for uh, uh, the Senegal field work. And my thesis was about basically self-recognition. And I believed that Gordon Gallup was wrong in 1970 when he stated that uh, perhaps self-recognition was only to be found in humans and our nearest primate neighbours, the great apes. I just didn't believe it. I thought those stumptail macaques and sterling are pretty smart. I'm going to get them to recognize themselves. So I tried many kinds of interventions, rearing monkeys with mirrors from shortly after birth, um, giving them group access and so on. Finally, my conclusion was that there was no evidence that any of them could recognize themselves. So that gave rise to a series of papers. Another couple of review papers based on my literature review. So again, I recommend it. Both of these have been well cited. This is a paper on human infants. Now, at that time, I had done no work personally on human infants, but I'd read enough and I knew that there was no real review paper uh, at the time. So I, I ran one up and got it uh, accepted. Um, and shortly after I finished my PhD, I received a phone call from France from a, a PhD student called Françoise Bayard, who had come to visit us for a few months in the Stirling Primate Unit. And she asked if I would be interested in a six month position in Strasbourg in France to uh, teach students in psychology and to do some research at the newly formed uh, Centre de Primatologie, the primate centre of the University Louis Pasteur. It's now called University of Strasbourg um, in, uh, in Strasbourg. So I thought, well, I've got nothing else planned. So I decided to go over to France for six months. Strasbourg, beautiful city in Eastern France. The Primate Centre is a remarkable place in a converted old military fort 
built in the 1860s by the German military when Germany was part, uh, when, when Alsace, the region of Strasbourg, uh, was part of Germany. Um, part of the fort, when it became French again uh, after the Second World War, it was used to stop munitions and part of it exploded in an accident in, in 1953. And so the military abandoned it and they gave it to the University of Louis Pasteur. And uh, one of the uses was uh, thanks to Nicola Herrenschmidt negotiating that it be used as a, a primate uh, research centre. So I went over there for what should have been six months and uh, things seemed to go well in terms of teaching. I struggled at first, but quickly became proficient at speaking French. So the teaching went well, as did the research. And uh, so I ended up staying for considerably longer. Uh, in fact, more than 12 years um, as a, a, a lecturer and then a researcher. Um, this is famous cathedral. And I was lucky enough to stay in two apartments. This is me in my first apartment, which stretched to this window here and around the corner to these windows here. Nice place. This, but then I moved uh, to another apartment just further along the street. Nice pedestrianized street. Um, and it was a, a short bus ride to the village where the and then a climb up a hill. To, to the fort. Um, so inside the fort, there are these long tunnels. There are some underground tunnels. Uh, here's the entrance to one of them. And uh, above the tunnels, there are some large wooded, naturally vegetated enclosures with different species of monkeys and uh, what used to be called prosimians, uh, some lemur species. And I was lucky enough in the 12 years there to study, carry out studies on all of the species that you can see here. You probably recognize most of them. Uh, pigtail macaques, stumptail macaques, and tonkian macaques, uh, long tail and rhesus macaques. Uh, black lemurs, the males are black, females are uh, brown color so-called brown lemurs and lemur cata. And uh, in the early years in Strasbourg, again with Francoise, uh, who was completing her PhD, we did a couple of studies on mirror image reactions, basically just adding to uh, the work that, that was accumulating in laboratories in, in several places. Uh, again, failing to, failing to show any signs of self-recognition. And I started to get a little bit more interested in tool use and set up a, a, a study with a group of Tonkian macaques uh, in a, an enclosure, um, basically mimicking Benjamin Beck's original study with Hamadryas baboons and found that two young adult males uh, soon learned to push a rod out into a plate of honey and pull it back in, uh, lick the honey. And they would also tolerate other members of the group coming to lick the honey. But nonetheless, there were only two uh, adult, young adult males who became the specialist tool users in the group. Um, capuchin monkeys, of course, are renowned for their tool use. And in the late 80s, interest in their tool using abilities was really uh, expanding in laboratories, um, not yet in the wild, but certainly in captive capuchins uh, in the United States and in Europe. And so we were lucky to have a group of Cebus apella that without any training whatsoever, were able to show that they knew how to crack open nuts using tools and they would also use tools as dipping tools. In, this is a container with honey. There are some holes 
in the container, but the honey is too, the level is too low for the, the capuchins to access it just with their fingers. So she promptly uh, went and tore off uh, a piece of vegetation, tore off some of the leaves, and then immediately knew uh, how to solve the problem. We also set uh, a, a number of tasks to the capuchins, um, some of which involved using uh, serial tool use or using uh, a tool set. So here's an adult male faced with the same problem as the female here. He wants access to the, to the honey. He knows that the tool that we gave him is uh, too thick. If he has no option, he will start to bite off the, 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 the bite off strips um, in order to produce a tool that's thin enough to go into the holes. But a much easier solution and less time consuming is to use that first stick as a tool to pull in a stick that he estimates is going to be adequate for the job. Um, so a nice series of uh, studies there and some tool use, uh, some mirror studies. And one of the things that we did discover was that although the monkeys showed no explicit evidence that they could recognize themselves, this monkey's making a grab for the monkey that he sees in the mirror as if it's another individual. Here, they're threatening individuals in the mirror. Um, but they could use the reflection to find hidden food. So please let me jump out of the show and show you a little video clip. First of all, uh, I'll show you two video clips. Here's a pigtail macaque, adult male, responding to his reflection in a mirror. This is a one-way mirror. I'm actually inside that box filming from inside. And we're not seeing the video if it's running, Jim. Sorry? We're not seeing the video if, if you got it running on your screen. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I think you just have to unshare and then. How can I unshare? So you can see my entire screen, yeah? We can still see your, your, your PowerPoint presentation, yeah. I think okay. maybe you have to move that to the side because I think now you're just sharing your screen. Okay, can you see this clip now? No. Okay, so, oh, I've got it. Yeah, I've got it. Um, so I have to stop sharing and I'll share again, but now move to the clip. Right, you got it. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so we'll go back to start. Um, so yeah, this is a couple of pigtail macaques that are being filmed. This is the first exposure to a mirror, large mirror. So you can see the males bit tense, showing these tension yawns, this protruded lips face that I'm going to talk about later. Um, yeah, and I mentioned that I'm filming this from the other side of a one-way mirror. I'm enclosed in a large box. Um, so responding to the image as if it's an unfamiliar monkey. Um, let me uh, now share, so I think I have to stop again or, um, you you're you're back on the screen with just your face, so I think you may be unshared. But yeah, if, unless you have the the box up on top with with, with the green and the I red. Can, can, can you see this? No. What? No. You have okay. to share it. No. Okay. So I've got to stop screen sharing. I apologize, but I'm really not 
good at this kind of thing. No problem. Yeah, um, we're all good, Jim. Okay. I don't even know now how, okay, how to share the screen again. Okay. And another clip. Okay, you have that? Yep, got it. Okay, okay. sorry about that. Um, okay, so this is one of the discoveries that I made about mirror image reactions. Here you can see this monkey using a mirror. It can see this target area. It can't see down here directly, but it can look in this mirror. Now I'm sticking a raisin onto this target. The monkey looks in the mirror, locates the raisin and directs his wrist. So another thing, so I'm making some false movements so the monkey just doesn't go to where my hand was. And that's the monkey looking at his own reflection. So we can see now what happens when we remove the reflection simply by turning the mirror over in this case. He knows what's coming, so he's not uh, so <laughs> happy about it. Um, so again, exactly the same problem. There's the raisins being stuck. Now he has no reflection to help him. So he's searching blind. And you know, if we do, if we compare the success rate and the amount of time taken. To, to find the reason without the mirror, it's just a huge difference. But the strange thing is that none of these, uh, none of these monkeys show anything like um, self-recognition. Can you see this? Do you have this? No. Yeah, it's a, it's a small screen though. You have to select. You have to screen share and then select that to to share. Okay. okay. So you got it. Yeah, so this is a group of bonobos uh, in a zoo in Belgium. And this is uh, for a documentary that I made some years ago. And you can see the difference in how bonobos and chimpanzees, well, most chimpanzees that uh, I've tested will do something similar. Instead of responding to their reflection, well, here's a group of chimps in a zoo in France. Uh, instead of responding to the reflection as if it's another unfamiliar individual, they use the mirror to investigate parts of their body that they don't normally see. So quite convincing evidence that they know that they're looking at themselves, but we don't see this evidence of the same degree of self-awareness in, uh, in monkeys. And uh, we, even if we do a, a, a famous mark test on monkeys, such as this macaque, who could, who's good at using the mirror to find, even in a new location, a uh, hidden food item, um, he shows no signs of self-recognition. He won't use attempt to use the mirror to remove a mark on his head. Um, okay, uh, while we were in Strasbourg, uh, I did a number of other studies looking at uh, social relations in the group, um, the effects of dominance in feeding competition 
situations, quite clear dominant individuals will monopolize a, a pile of food until they're satisfied. Um, and then you've got an intermediate ranking group of monkeys who wait just outside of the danger zone. And uh, the subordinate monkeys, they tend to just keep out of trouble. They'll wait until they know that they've got access. Everything might be gone by the time the subordinates do come there, or there might just be scraps. But that's a fairly easily replicable situation. Uh, and what we also found in these situations was that in general, the dominant individuals were fairly unaggressive. Nobody dared to take the risk of incurring their, their wrath. The intermediate ranking monkeys were clearly the most aggressive. And I can understand why. I think they were frustrated. They wanted access to the food. They didn't dare go near the, the dominance. And so they took it out on the subordinate individuals and they would get into fights with each other. Jim, if you're if you're meaning to share your PowerPoint again, it's not up on screen. Okay. Okay. So okay. Good. Now, okay. Um, so that that basically just uh, illustrates what I've been saying: dominance, monopolize the attractive food source. The intermediates are frustrated and therefore aggressive with each other and with more subordinate individuals. Um, and we, we found that in several studies. Um, but in one of the interesting studies with a, an undergraduate uh, student sent from, who came over from Stirling, uh, is we actually manipulated the food attractive food to make it potentially a source of danger. You can probably just make out here a rubber snake on top of the pile of food. And there was a, a, a translucent fishing line, uh, which allowed us to make the snake move if ever any of the monkeys approached it. Uh, and that basically, changed things quite remarkably. Now, here is the dominant individual in the group enjoying a nice pile of food. Here is the dominant individual here with a pile of bananas with a snake on top of it. Increase that kind of risk, the dominants are sometimes among the most conservative members of the group but some more subordinate individuals will see that the subordinates are holding back and they may well take the risk of going for this food, which they might otherwise not be able to access. If this is a low quality food that's guarded by a rubber snake, such as carrots, nobody goes, neither the dominants nor the subordinates or the intermediates. But if it's a highly valued food, some of them will take the risk. And uh, we also did what I think was probably the first experimental study of self-directed scratching in monkeys. And we found that again, in feeding uh, competition situations, especially intermediate ranking monkeys, would show an increase in self-directed scratching. And here you can see the, the, uh, the percentage of scratching episodes directed to different parts of the body uh, and how that compares with self-directed grooming. Um, and we suggest, we also noticed that most scratching occurred when monkeys were in close proximity to other monkeys and just before they were going to change their behavior. And our suggestion was that it could actually be a, 
a communicative signal to warn or to alert the animal in proximity that I'm going to change behaviour. Okay. to avoid any misunderstanding of a sudden change in behaviour. Um, so the, the monkey might be grooming another individual. It will stop grooming, scratch, and then walk off. Whereas if it suddenly just was sitting either close beside the monkey or even grooming and walking, just suddenly walking away, then it might and somehow go against uh, their social norms. Um, and now scratching is a frequently used measure of potential anxiety uh, in, in, in groups. And I like to think that this was there uh, at the start of the whole thing. And that got me thinking, well, if monkeys can scratch uh, as a signal, if, if that natural behavior has been co-opted into their communicative repertoire. What about other behaviors? And of course, yawning is frequently used and it's used in what used to be called old world monkeys, in particular the adult males, as a kind of threat signal. In tense situations, males might get into a kind of yawning competition. Um, so we did a couple of studies, the first one on a couple of uh, adult male pigtail macaques, looking at whether their rate of yawning could be brought under control by rewarding them with food. So every time they produced a yawn, they would receive uh, a food reward. And we, did the, we tried the same with another behavior, scratching. Um, they sometimes scratch with their, their leg and foot like a dog, but most of their natural scratching is actually with their hands. Um, but, and we also tried that facial expression you saw being directed towards the mirror, the protruded lips face. And basically, I won't go into details, the answer was yes. They would yawn extremely frequently, if the yawns were followed by a food reward, and if we stopped rewarding them, it would quickly go down to the baseline level of a couple of times per 30 minutes. The same goes for uh, scratching. We couldn't get them to uh, produce the protruded lips face for yawning. If somebody wants to know why, we can discuss it later, but I'm aware that we have to get through time. We did a couple of studies. We also did a study of uh, uh, operant conditioning of scratching and lemurs. Unlike monkeys, most of their scratching is uh, naturally with their, their leg um, and foot, but uh, easily brought under control. And you can even get them to change. So if they, they previously scratched with the right foot, the next scratch must be with the left foot and they can do it. Um, and with the monkeys, you can also get them to scratch. Their next scratch must be a region of the body that they didn't scratch previously, which is interesting in terms of how they can memorize the different self-directed acts to body regions. Um, but that's another topic. Still in Strasbourg, we did some other studies. We can't go into everything there. This was an interesting one. We had a few very old stump tail macaques, the first species I studied in Stirling, uh, and some young adults. And um, we started studying the effects of aging uh, on memory and learning in macaques and we found one of the interesting studies was that um, the old monkeys were slower to learn a simple visual discrimination. Food is always hidden under this item, not the other one, uh, <clears throat> compared to young monkeys. Then once they've finally mastered it and we suddenly change 
the rule. Now the food is only under here. Well, the classic finding is that the first reversal or two may be more difficult than the original learning. For young adults too, and that's exactly what we found, and it was the same for the old monkeys. Now, many research teams that are interested in the effects of aging on cognition, they find the original difficulty with the old monkeys and they stop. We just had the idea of continuing over many blocks of reversals. I think this was something like 55 reversals. And what we found was that eventually the old monkeys could switch from one rule to the other just as effectively as uh, the young monkeys. So the take home message there is yeah, as old guys can be slow at learning, but if we keep practicing, then in some domains, we can, uh, we can match the youngsters. Um, one of my PhD students, Elizabeth Lud in, in France, continued working on deep litters uh, and found that uh, the capuchin monkeys she studied had preferences for different activities in different kinds of litter. Um, they preferred foraging in wood chips. The youngsters preferred playing in wood wool and the monkeys preferred covering their bodies in peat, um, kind of anointing themselves uh, because of the acidic qualities of the peat. Um, other enrichment studies that I, I instigated in France, an interesting one was using the monkeys, macaques, natural proclivity for swimming. And we did a couple of interesting studies there on the emergence of specialists in a group of an underwater foraging task, releasing the bananas that float to the surface and then the other individuals can come uh, and, and take them. But only two individuals in a group of 17 actually would learn how to do the task. But most of the individuals, once the box was empty, they all enjoyed swimming, playing with each other, pushing each other into the water uh, and so on. And they would spend hours doing that. A um, couple of side uh, effects at uh, Sterling uh, with Jean-Jacques Roder. We, uh, we actually organized and edited the first ever collection of French primatology chapters. Um, and as far as I know, it hasn't been, there, there's no equivalent even today. And uh, we also <laughs> uh, took on the task of organizing uh, in 1992, the 14th IPS Congress. And that was an enormous task, which basically uh, Nicola Herrenschmidt, the director of the Primate Center, uh, here's Nicola feeding one of the young stump tails. Um, Jean-Jacques, Nicola, myself, Bernard Thierry, and two secretaries organized everything. Um, and it was really a, a job that I, I wouldn't like to, to repeat. And then most of the following year was taken up organizing the publication of the proceedings. My last project in uh, Strasbourg before moving back to Stirling, again, um, I was interested in the amount of attention uh, monkeys would pay to other individual's gaze. And uh, this arose from a, a reviewer comment on one of my earlier studies on object choice. The reviewer suggested, was I sure that the monkeys weren't being cued by something I might be doing? Uh, and so I thought, well, let's turn that around and ask whether monkeys will, if I actually try to help them, uh, choose the correct object, can they do it? So I used an object choice task with, the first one was with three 
capuchin monkeys, kind of basic delayed response task. The monkey, here the monkey can see that I place the food under this object and nothing under the other object. Um, this is done actually while the screen is down. So I've hidden the object, the screen goes up and two basic conditions, baseline, I'm staring straight ahead, giving no obvious cue to the monkey. Or I can explicitly gaze at the baited container. So the question is, will the monkeys learn to use my gaze as a cue? Here are the results for three monkeys. Of course, chance, choice is 50%. No difference. The monkeys don't use gaze spontaneously as a cue. So I thought, well, okay, let's make it easier. I'll, you can't get much more explicit than gazing and pointing. Monkeys had no problem with that. Now, I'm not saying that the monkeys understand pointing gestures. <clears throat> you can see that clearly the cue here is very close to the object. And monkeys do pay attention to people's hands. Um, but nonetheless, the pointing gesture here is associated with gaze. So then we can ask, well, let's go back to gaze. Will the monkey now remember that the pointing gesture was associated with gaze? The answer was no. Monkeys still don't use gaze. And in fact, if we remove the gaze from the gaze and point gesture, monkeys are happy to use the point uh, without gaze. That was replicated also in a study in Stirling with rhesus monkeys and <clears throat> it's been replicated in many labs now all over uh, in, in different labs, in different continents. Um, just before I left Strasbourg, Shoji Itakura from Japan came and trained up a, a juvenile capuchin monkey by basically putting his eyes and head as close as his hand was to the, the, the correct object. And he found that that did actually help. If we call this gaze one, that actually helped the monkey um, to, to uh, use the head and eye orientation. And so when he then moved his head further back, as we had used previously, the monkey soon mastered how to use the head and the eyes together as a cue. But when it came to simply using eyes only, so what's called glance here, the monkey couldn't uh, use it. And that was interesting because, of course, uh, human, the, 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 the morphology of the human eye is marked by the amount of light, which can help us to follow uh, gaze direction based on eye direction alone. Most non-human primates don't have so much white uh, sclera in the eyes. Um, and here's uh, another little study on what I call uh, uh, visual co-orientation in a park with a stumptail monkey, occasionally feeding and keeping the monkey occupied and suddenly stopping and changing, looking at something behind. And the monkey um, uh, changes to co-orient with me. And then she looks back to see what I'm doing. Try the same thing with lemurs. Here are the monkeys in almost every occasion they would, uh, the adults would turn to look in the same direction. The lemurs were less likely than chance to actually look uh, in the, the, the same direction. Um, but then I, I got 
the offer of a job in Stirling, I had actually applied for various reasons. I was thinking about uh, about leaving Stirling, uh, leaving Strasbourg, and I applied for one job and, and uh, it, it was rejected. Um, but a few months later, I got a, an offer of a, a, a more senior position in Stirling. So I did go back and uh, continued doing some work uh, on various topics, another couple of updated um, sleep reviews, continued doing work uh, on primates and human children. Um, but most of my work on primates was now through uh, graduate students or undergraduate students. And I am aware that I've gone over time, so I won't go into these in detail. Um, if anyone wants more information, uh, we can talk about these. But in 1998, I started a long, uh, a long series of trips to Japan to Kazuo Fujita's lab and with uh, Kaz, the help of Kaz and some students at the time, um, some of them are mentioned here, Hikakurashima, Yuko uh, Hattori, we did a number of interesting studies, partly on gaze, various questions on learning, Petsuro Matsuzawa uh, helped to organize and run the first demonstration that chimpanzees were susceptible to contagious yawning. And now that's been picked up and has been replicated in various laboratories. Studies on visual perception and preferences, self-control, uh, delay of gratification, and studies on responses to video images of self, again with one of my students, Annika Pockner, Studies on social evaluation that really caught on uh, and now have been extended to other species of primates. Um, uh, helpfulness, reciprocity. Monkeys uh, will watch what's going on between two other individuals and tend to avoid somebody who responds negatively to a third party. Um, and Tetsuro Matsuzawa was also generous in making his field site available to two of my Sterling students. And uh, one of them uh, with whom I've published, Kim Hawkins, did some very interesting work uh, uh, that we can mention. Since I came back to Kyoto permanently in 2014, We've just continued some other studies uh, on other uh, species as well. In my capacity as a, a vice editor of the journal Primates, I can write kind of review papers on work that I've done. With Hikakuroshima, we recently published uh, a book. Basically, it's a tribute to Kazuo Fujita's laboratory here, and uh, the authors are mostly ex-students of CAS or colleagues who have been influenced in one way or another by some of CAS's work. Uh, recently, I published with Bill McGrew and a, a French photographer who has set up camera traps and uh, video traps in Gabon. And we published one interesting paper on chimpanzees. Uh, also have some papers uh, planned uh, based on the hundreds of video clips that Xavier has made. Uh, my interest in comparative thanatology uh, continues and uh, recently completed a recent study thanks to uh, Satoshi um, Hirata and uh, handling QM uh, at the, the, the Kumamoto site. And uh, final advice 
to students, accept review requests when they come in. We editors find it difficult sometimes to find reviewers because people say they're too busy. What they mean is that they're too busy writing their own papers. Um, this is a list of the journals that I've reviewed papers for. I stopped counting uh, after 500. Um, but I would finish with what I call the Zen approach. Every paper that you submit will create work for at least two people reading your paper, deciding whether it's appropriate for the journal, deciding whether it should be sent to reviewers and the reviewers or referees will then have to devote time to doing it. So you're producing work for two or three other people. So for every paper you review, then I would uh, recommend that you consider accepting to return the favour. Oops, okay. So I'll finish there. I've gone over time. Thank you so much for uh, your attention.